And good evening and welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. We are on the road to Town Meeting Day 2020. And this is going to be a really interesting election because in one district we have both seats up. Uh, when Ashley Hill resigned, we have her one-year term. And when Glenn decided that he wasn't going to do it again, Glenn Hutchinson, um, we have a two-year term up and we have people running for both. And that's, that's an interesting situation. In District 2, Connor Casey is running unopposed. And in District 1, Donna Bate is running unopposed. And this is going to be a trend that you're going to see over and over tonight. And uh, what we did was we filmed a show with both of them. And it's a really good show, well worth watching. It went over an hour. We separated <laughs> it into two pieces. But it's a very good piece of television. And then Ann Watson's running for mayor again against no one. <laughs> and so basically, you see the trend. We have the school board. And uh, all of the candidates who are running are going to be in the school board. They're all running essentially unopposed, continuing the trend. And we have Libby coming in to discuss the school board budget. We have Bill coming in to discuss the city budget. And all of these are really good shows and well worth watching. And we hope you will watch them. Tonight, I have an honor of again interviewing Ann Watson, uh, who I interviewed in her first time running for city council. And now yeah. I'm interviewing her current run to be reelected for mayor. And when did that interview first take place, the first one? Oh, goodness, that would have been in uh, 2013, I think, because I was originally appointed in 2012, uh, and then I ran to keep my seat in 2013. Boy, that seems so long ago. I know. <laughs> I can't even believe it was that long ago I, that it was six, it was, you know, it, well, it seems no, like seven, seven years, years of Wednesday ago. nights that, that you've been booked. What's that? It's, it's a years of Wednesday nights. Yes. <laughs> that you've been missing from Sometimes action. it feels like that, but, <laughs> but no, it's good. <laughs> Nobody gets rich on city council. No, yeah, not with this form of government. Uh, yeah. And nobody gets rich being the mayor of no. Montpelier. No. Now, before we start this discussion, I want to say that you've started something that no mayor has done. You have hours? Oh, <laughs> yeah. So I started holding office hours. Um, I uh, aspire to be better at um, announcing them, actually. So I'm glad we're talking so, about exactly. this. Exactly. At the this beginning is of great. the show, at the end of the show, I hope to remember to ask you to announce the yes. office hours again. Uh, yeah, my, I've been uh, meaning to, to post them on Front Porch Forum. I was so inspired by Glenn Coburn Hutchinson, who uh, has, has been great about posting his office hours and announcing them. And um, Two months he does it as well. He, I'm sorry? Tina Muncy. Oh, Tina Muncy. Oh, that's great. Holds yeah, so, um, so I've been holding uh, some office hours. Uh, when are they? They are Tuesday uh, at City Hall from 3.30 to 4.30. Okay, where in City Hall? So <laughs> there, um, there's a, I actually have a little office space, which is great. Um, this is also sort of new for mayors. I don't think any mayor had an office at City Hall. Now, where is your office uh, space in so City Hall? So it is just outside of the assistant city manager's office. So it's right next to uh, the council chambers. Uh, anyway, so uh, cause especially as a teacher in the summertime, uh, when the school closes down, I, find, I, I found uh, a couple years ago that I just had no place to work besides my house. And so I was like, hey, you know, there's nobody in this room. There's a desk and a telephone. Do you think I could uh, use this as an office? And they were like, okay. So it worked out. Uh, just for the record, for those who do not know you, yeah. you are a teacher teaching what? Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, so because being mayor doesn't, doesn't pay the bills, uh, I have to keep my day job, obviously, which is... Um, uh, I'm a, a teacher at Montpelier High School. I teach physics and engineering and a little bit of math. Uh, and I've done that at Montpelier now for, this is year 15, uh, which also blows my mind that it's been that long. <laughs> and for people who still think of you as the ultimate Frisbee coach, oh, you are not the ultimate Frisbee coach. This is true. So I have coached the ult at least one of the ultimate teams at Montpelier High School for the past nine years and I 
uh, decided to step away from that after last season. We had a great season. We won the state championships. Woohoo! Uh, and not so I coached the boys uh, varsity team and or coached the boys varsity team and the girls varsity team also won uh, last season. So it was great to have double wins. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it was. Uh, proving to be more time than I could really dedicate, especially also being mayor. <laughs> Is it ever possible, you see in small towns across America, that when you win state championships, it appears at the sign in the border of the town. Is it possible to adjust the signs on the border of the town to indicate that Montpelier boys and girls have the ultimate, the statewide ultimate Frisbee championship? That is an interesting proposal. I want it to be noted that I did not think of that <laughs> um, because I, I would certainly. Um, uh, and it, and it I, does. Well, it does. Give yeah. Our, interesting. It's our an interesting idea. Quirky image. <laughs> yeah, it's a, true. A shot. I was going to say that would probably require um, having changeable, like our, the signs at the edge of town. Uh, exactly. Having and like they, interchangeable wording. Right. They've wording. always done that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I don't when, know. Something but we can look into. When a team wins a state's a state championship, even yeah. if it's a state debating championship, yeah. could we honor that on our, our, on our Something we can talk about. Um, Montpelier. Montpelier. When did you move here? Uh, I moved here in 2008, uh, right at the height of the housing bubble, actually. That's how I remember it. Um, but uh, I grew up in Essex. I was born in Burlington lived, uh, you know, basically, you know, my whole childhood in Essex and then left for college, uh, left Vermont for college and came back and uh, lived in Essex uh, while I was uh, teaching in Montpelier and then eventually bought a condo here in Montpelier in 2008. Did you, um, did you try to be a page? I was never a page. I didn't think that I, I didn't realize that I, you know, had any political interests at all. Uh, until I moved here. I mean, I think in college I was like, you know, I could picture maybe getting into politics, but uh, that's, that's probably never going to happen. Uh, and then, uh, actually, uh, when I was originally appointed, it was right around the time that I had started to pay attention to politics in uh, the city of Montpelier, uh, particularly around um, streetlights and uh, around the district heat plant that was at the time still being debated. And they must have been discussing parking. Uh, I'm sure they were. <laughs> they were <I'm>, always discussed <laughs> parking. Always, uh, this is what, something I've learned is that uh, discussions about parking have gone on forever. <laughs> and forever. Um, well, for a long time anyway. And uh, so I, I was starting to be just more conscious of what was going on here. And then um, actually a friend of mine, colleague of mine, uh, wondered if I would um, be interested in putting my name in for the appointment, and I thought, you know, yeah, I could, I could do that. I'd put myself forward. Were you forward. aware of the time commitment at that point? Um, I, I did ask. Uh, I don't think that I had. I don't know that I really realized how much it would be. I, I think I probably underestimated it. Uh, but everyone we, does. Yeah, but it, but uh, you know, on the on the face of it, I knew, you know, there were two meetings a month, uh, roughly, and that there would be committees that I, you know, every counselor is expected to be on some committees. Uh, and beyond that, uh, you know, meeting with the city manager to, to just keep up to date. Now you've been on so many different councils here with yes. so many different characters. Yes. Uh, I ask this of city council candidates. I don't sure. ask this of mayoral. But it's you've okay. Been, you, you are, in a sense, the super city councilor. <laughs> I guess. In well, this and I think it's important to note that I can vote on the council and in break a, ties. What's that? I, I can break ties, or I can make a fourth uh, if someone is absent. Um, so, in any case, yeah, it's it is sort of like being a select board chair in that way. But anyway, you were saying. I was saying, is there a city councilor of the past who you look you look at and say? I really like that person's style, and I really emulated that person when I was on council. I felt that they did it right. Well, I would say that I have a great deal of respect. Uh, well, I should say, I, I've been grateful to work with all of the city councilors that, um, that I've served with. Um, but I was just so impressed by Rosie Kruger. 
Uh, she From was, Sump Pump and now Finch Lane? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Um, what, what was it about Rosie? Rosie? She took her job very seriously. She did. She um, uh, was just incredibly thorough uh, and had really thoughtful questions and uh, was just... Um, she was just really uh, on, on top of, uh, you know, looking at multiple angles of all the policies we would adopt. And, uh, and I would say, too, I mean, there were times that we disagreed on things. And I, you know, she was, um, uh, this is true of many other city councilors as well, but, uh, but also true of Rosie that uh, she was just also very respectful about the manner in which she disagreed about things. Uh, I think that's really an important quality uh, when it comes to city councilors uh, that uh, you know we're able to to have a dialogue where we're really hearing each other and uh, coming from different places potentially and being able to see each other's perspectives and potentially disagree, but still be able to walk away and um, be collegial and you know not have it impact you know future relationship um, so the yeah. city manager works for the mayor and for city council yes you've worked with the same city manager <laughs> yes other than his vast institutional history knowledge and history what are yeah. Bill's strengths um, I would say that Bill is uh, Bill Fraser yes Bill Fraser city manager um, he's incredibly ethical uh, he's very professional um, I think that he's, um, uh, I would say that he uh, manages his staff well, uh, and, uh, you know, it's clear that, um, you know, uh, he sticks up for them and, and uh, you know, and they generally, right, like, like working for him. I, I can't, I have not talked to everyone in the city, so I can't say that down to a person, obviously, but, you know, I think he, I think he leads well. We're in an era of real transition in terms of city staff. Tom McArdle yes. has been replaced by Donna Casey. Yep. Tony Fakos is retiring soon, our police chief. Yep. What's your, what are your thoughts on, on Tom McArdle and, and Tony? Well, I Again, think those were significant names during your period on oh, council absolutely. and as mayor. Oh, uh, absolutely. Gosh, and I, I've really enjoyed working with them. Uh, and I... I, I think Donna Barlow Casey is also excellent, um, and so I'm I'm psyched to have her on as well. Uh, and we're going to have a huge job in front of us to uh, to find a new police chief because uh, I I think Tony's done a, a good job. And what is um, your ideal police chief? If you, if you had to put yeah. kind of not a person but just uh, the kind the of characteristics? Uh, the characteristics that yeah, you're looking for, yeah. what would that be? Well, so I think the values of the police chief matter a lot, uh, particularly around dealing with vulnerable populations. Um, and what would a vulnerable population be? Well, so uh, uh, populations that have seen discrimination, uh, typically. Keep going. Well, sure. Those yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. So uh, uh, homelessness. Uh, or, well. Right. So uh, those folks experiencing homelessness, but as as well, you know. Um, uh, people of color, uh, and and I guess those are r really the two that I'm I'm thinking of right now because I mean we need to be um, you know battling uh, discrimination in all its forms and Didn't yeah. Did we set up a committee on that? We did, yeah, <laughs> a couple of committees okay. actually. What are the couple of committees? Yeah, when so, were they set up, and what are the goals and objectives? Yeah, so um, one committee is the social and economic justice uh, committee that I uh, was really looking at how the, the goal overall the, um, is to see how the city can be uh, addressing issues of... Uh, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. Who is chairing that? Um, I think it has changed over time, and so I'm not sure who's the chair now. I think it might, there might be co-chairs, um, so I'd have to get back to you about When that. was that established? Gosh, it's probably not more than two years old. Um, I think that was, yeah, I'll, I'll say that. What have that. they turned out? What, what are the tangible results that that committee has? Well, that's a good question. So uh, they um, uh, took a, 
quite a bit of time to to sort of help understand what the council was asking of them, which I think is a reasonable question. Um, but one of the things that we asked them about uh, was thinking about um, having a minimum wage policy for the city similar to Burlington's. Who on council was championing that? Um, Ashley Hill. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so she was the council liaison for, uh, for a while. And anyway, so um, one of the members of the um, Social and Economic Justice Committee, uh, Michael Sherman, uh, really took on um, doing some research for the council on um, the type of minimum wage uh, ordinance that the city of Burlington has and found that to be incredibly useful um, in informing our Are decision. Are they above the, um, the state minimum wage? Um, I believe I believe so, yeah. Uh, but well, but it's to be fair, it's not for the whole city of Burlington, it's just for any municipal contracts. Okay. So that, it's sort of self-imposed. Right. Yes, that, it is important because otherwise it would have to be a charter permission to exactly. do that. Um, but nonetheless, what is a we were thinking permission? Well, so in Vermont, municipalities only have permission to write ordinances about uh, that which we are expressly given permission to write ordinances about. So, for example, we could, in the city of Montpelier, we couldn't just say, we are going to, you know... We're going to let non-citizens right, vote. Right, non-citizen <laughs> vote. Um, we would have to get special permission from the legislature to, um, to have that. Uh, which is actually what we did um, not that long ago. Uh, and um, so we, we passed that charter amendment at the city level, has to go to the legislature for approval before we can actually enact that as a city. Um, and, uh, you know, similar with, uh, you know, things around energy efficiency, similar, um, to, uh, anyway, there's, that's, local that's options the tax. local options task at tax. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. So, um, how did we get here, though? Um, we were talking about... We were talking about economic justice. Uh, but yes, and um, if the city was going to have a minimum wage. But so we ended up not uh, pursuing uh, having a minimum wage for all uh, municipal contracts like Burlington does, but we did establish a responsible employer ordinance which uh, requires uh, proper classification of construction workers uh, and proper allocation of benefits uh, to those workers uh, for any large city projects. So that was um, that was a step in that direction, and I think was a good um, test for us to see how that would work. Because really, the barrier there was management. Um, how would how would we act? On what level? Well, in, I'm sorry, in terms of enforcement, right? Like, how would we know? Uh, and th that. I mean, we could ask for um, all kinds of paperwork from the uh, people that we contract with, but to evaluate that um, would, it would just take a lot of time. A and we may go there in the future, but um, this was our first step. Now that was one committee. You said there were several yes, committees. Yes, yes. Well, there were two. So the Social and Economic Justice Committee was one, and then the other is a Homelessness Task Force. And so that committee is more recent, and the, they were formed... Um, uh, because there, this past summer, as in previous summers, um, there have been um, just difficult situations um, uh, in downtown where there are people uh, uh, hanging out, uh, begging, uh, loitering, um, and th th or smoking potentially. And it, what conflict? Uh, or that that is actually you know has been a conflict for business owners um, in the downtown and understandable. Um, so we formed this committee to see what we could potentially, potentially be doing to help alleviate those conflicts. And we're uh, wondering, you know, asking the questions like, what are the gaps uh, in services to um, the homeless population to see if the city of Montpelier could play a role in filling some of those gaps? But didn't that committee quickly move into the question of how how long the shelter in the church would be open during the early part of the cold season? Yes, yeah, so that was uh, one of their that early on in their existence. They uh, they came to the council and said uh, it's going to get cold before the warming shelter officially opens. Could we not allocate? Um, I think it was ten thousand dollars or fifteen thousand. Yeah, ten thousand for. Um, 
uh, for, to open the shelter early. What is a warming shelter? So it's a space uh, that, uh, well, so the, the warming shelter in Montpelier specifically, right. or are you, asking, are you asking about them in general? No, in, in Montpelier. In Montpelier. Uh, yeah, so it was in the basement of uh, Bethany Church, and uh, it was for single men, so you know, no, no children and no women, and uh, it was a place for people to, uh, to uh, have a bed overnight, uh, but was not uh, open as such during the day. Now, are families staying at the church? Uh, to my knowledge, they're not, because okay. that's not um, part of that function uh, there. So they're staying in Barry. I think there's a gap, uh, honestly, uh, for uh, women and families experiencing homelessness. Now, we should say, in, in a salute to the Homeless Task yes. Force, that this is the hardest working group yeah. of volunteers. Yeah. They meet every week. Yes, they meet every week, um, and so actually, sorry, I want to back up to the, because yes, there, there are shelters in Barry that people can go to um, if they're, you know, women or, or um, families, families. Uh, but there's not enough. <laughs> so I want to just clarify that comment. Uh, but yes, no, they are working very hard. They meet, meet during the day, and they, are, they have been make, meeting weekly. I, I, I'm a little worried that that may not be sustainable, but you know what, like, all, all the more power to them um, because it's an important topic. Well, let's go to another. Let's stay on committees. Sure. Uh, the Transportation Committee. Yeah. Because they've been active this year. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to walk you through the calming study on Barry and, and on Main Street. Yes. I'm going to start heading into town over by the gas station. We're going to turn towards the bridge. Is there any change in that light that's proposed? Do you mean the one that is at Memorial Drive exactly. in Maine? Exactly. Right, okay. we're going to start in front of the gas okay. station at Memorial okay. Drive in Maine. There's there no change, change there. That's the same. Will that be a time light in the future? Well, so the, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but um, we did actually approve a light to be at Berry Street and Main Street. I haven't hit that part Okay, yet. I was going to say, it's not timed, but there's plans for it to be... Um, coordinated with other lights. What is the difference between coordinated and timed? It's coordinated means what? Well, so I'd have to get back to you about that. I don't know. Okay. Okay. I think <laughs> it's when there aren't cars, mm -hmm. it doesn't automatically go off. Yeah. You know, in a sense. Yeah. So we're at Barry and we're at Main Street. Barry and Main. We have a pathway that's coming across yep. with pedestrians and bicycles. Yep. Will there still be that flashing light or what will appear there? So there will be a, a light at that intersection. And a traffic light. A traffic light, yes. A three-way traffic light. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, because there is no fourth. No, there fourth. is a fourth. The fourth is, oh, is, is coming out of the back parking lot. Exactly. Okay. It's the um, sort of like the driveway to behind right. the drawing okay. board and, and Oakshans. Right, so it's a four-way stop. Yeah. A four-way um, light. Mm -hmm. And it, that will actually be squared up, uh, which is in itself exciting. But... Uh, yeah. Squared up meaning what? Well, so... Uh, pr oh, I'm asking an no, person who teaches fine. engineering. Yeah, no, fair enough. So uh, just the um, prior to the work that's been done, that's already been done, uh, the entrant, that driveway was on top of the railroad tracks. And so it was actually a little bit askew from Barry Street. Uh, but now it'll be directly across from Barry Street. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Now there's a bike path that will... Yes. Be connecting at that point. Connecting yes. in what sense? So there's the new pedestrian bridge, uh, and that goes to the to the shared use path, and that will um, actually before we get to the light, that will be completed and uh, come right up to Main Street, which is very exciting. Uh, but yeah, so once the uh, light is put in, um, then there'll be crossing signals and whatnot, just like at um, State and Main. And uh, the, the a plan that was approved, sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of us again here a little bit, but um, because the, the shared use path uh, would otherwise have a gap between Main Street and the uh, rec building on Berry Street. Right. And so there's, we, we want to obviously connect it. And so uh, it would stay on the south side of Berry Street and it would connect, so you'd be able to, to cross at Main and then stay on a, a shared use path uh, all the way from, um, 
from Main Street along Berry Street to the rec building, where it would then go past the rec building and connect to the remainder of the Chinese How path. would that reflect in parking, existing parking on the south side? Yes, yeah, so there is a loss of, uh, I think it's about 10 uh, parking spaces. Um, so on the shared use would be in the street in that parking area? So it would, it, it would, um, it, in, it would be replacing um, some of the sidewalk that's there, uh, expanding that out, and then um, removing the, the parking on, uh, on that side of the street, which was less than removing the parking on the other side of the street, on the north side of Berry Street. So that of the two choices, that was But the north better. side is proximate to the church that really sees yes. proximate parking. Well, and Sundays. also the laundromat. Right, and the laundromat um, as yeah. well. So, um, now, yeah. Now, I'm at that light. Okay. And w that means that it's going to be easier to turn south from Berry Street onto Main Street, which is right now is a real challenge getting to Memorial yes. from, from Berry yes. Street. Yes, I mean, it's challenging um, in multiple directions, I would say. Yeah, it's, it can be challenging to... So, sorry, are you, were you thinking you were on Main Street turning on no, to No, I'm on Berry Street, Street in Street. front of the laundromat. Yeah, I'm trying to, to turn, turn onto Memorial. I'm trying to turn south to get to Memorial. Yes. So there'll yes. be a light that will allow right. that traffic and to so do... And so that, they, you know, the, the wait times um, at that intersection should be less. Because um, that's right, right now we... Well, so we grade intersections based on the wait time. And uh, they have letter grades, and that's an F grade intersection. So we're traveling through, right now, what is the current speed limit on Main Street? Uh, I believe it's 25. I believe it's 25. It's 25 will it yeah. remain 25, or will it go down to 20 with mixed-use traffic along with bicycles? So as uh, I, we've talked, we've not talked about changing the speed limit. So the plan, I think, would be to keep it at 25, yeah. But we could have that conversation, too, if there's interest. <laughs> uh, we're going down towards State and Maine. I presume that that okay. light will remain the same. Yes. Except for it might be timed and coordinated. Exactly. It might be coordinated with the other, um, the other two lights. To keep traffic flowing yes. in a more smooth, intelligent right. manner. Right. So we're heading north on Main Street. Yep. Is there a crosswalk at Langdon, or does the crosswalk move to Shippey North? It does, north? yes. So uh, that was another piece that was approved. Uh, so it was a, there was a fair bit of discussion about how close that crosswalk was to the intersection of State and Main uh, and how sometimes it holds up traffic. You know, it's a green light, but you're waiting for a pedestrian to cross. Uh, or people might just and, you know, not wait at the intersection of State and Main and just you know, bypass it. Uh, by using the crosswalks, I've done it. Like I, it's pretty normal, uh, but just putting it a little bit further um, beyond uh, Over Langdon by where Street, Shippy is where Shippy often. is, yeah. Uh, so it's not a huge shift, but um, should give people at least a little bit more of a buffer before there's like a backup, um, you know, into the intersection. Now we're continuing north, and we do hit something, something that's new. quite new. Yes, so we uh, approved a roundabout for the intersection of School Street and Main. The so library. The library, yes, right there. Uh, and which uh, made sense to us uh, because that's a relatively large intersection. Uh, so it can handle a roundabout. So you can actually get off of School Street going south now yes. on Main Street. <laughs> yes, right, you can turn left there. Uh, yeah, so, and then it's also um, quite a wide intersection um, at, as a pedestrian, and so that can be a little daunting. And so having a roundabout there um, actually helps break that up a little bit. Um, having a little some islands um, of safety uh, potentially, um, and and it would should flow together with uh, the roundabout that's uh, further down the road on Main Street. Right over yeah. Spring Street. Yeah, exactly. When does this happen? Well, that's a great question. So uh, we anticipate that. Uh, that a whole all that whole plan isn't going to happen all at once. That would be a significant amount of money, uh, but we do have a capital budget, and we I we, we don't know which part yet of that will be implemented, but it'll be one piece of that. And I, I think it's likely to be the light at Berry Street and Main Street, uh, but uh, I don't want to say that 100% for certain yet. 
Will the uh, flashing lights at Berry Street and Main Street that you can press now yeah. and that speak to you in Spanish instead of French, <laughs> yeah. um, will those lights be moved over to the crosswalk at Chippy? Well, if they're no longer needed at Berry and Main because we have a light uh, with, with you know, um, pedestrian signals there as well, we will certainly repurpose it um, elsewhere that where it's most needed. And I, I don't know where that will be, but um, it's a great asset and we, it needs to be, uh, there are other places that certainly need it. I, those were put out because people were getting hit yeah. over at Barry. Yeah. Did those work? Uh, well, so I'm trying to think of like when the last accident was. And I, um, I'm not sure, because the most recent accident was pretty, pretty recent there. Were um, they in the crosswalk, though? They were not in the... Because other people who've been hit in right. there are not they in the crosswalk. They were not in the crosswalk. Um, I, I think any... Can't blame the flashing lights yeah, if you're not yeah. in the crosswalk. So any, anything we can do to make that intersection safer uh, is a high priority, for sure. So this we can see bit by bit over the next several years. Yes, yes. It's going it, to, just by virtue of it being expensive, it will have to be incremental.